Um, our next speaker is Jacob Kaplan-Moss, and he will be teaching us about assets in Django. Please make him feel welcome. Howdy, folks. So I started this talk with a, um, a hypothesis. I've always been super frustrated with managing static assets in Django. It's been one of the parts that I feel like you know I'm, I'm supposedly the Django creator, and I ought to I ought to know it. But I really I, it never felt easy. It never felt um, never felt smooth. And I as so I had this idea, okay, I'm going to propose a talk for PyCon, and if it's if it's accepted, I will be forced to figure it out. I'll get to write. <laughs> It's called conference-driven development, everyone. Um, I'll be forced to figure it out. I'll be, I'll be I'll, I'll able to finally come up with a good answer, and it will no longer be hard again. I am sorry to report that my hypothesis was incorrect, um, and the title is somewhat misleading. It is, in fact, not possible to handle assets in Django entirely smoothly and entirely easily. Um, and that's because while the simple things are simple and easy, the hard things are actually hard. Um, unfortunately, so the title is a bit of a uh, a bit of a bait and switch. But hopefully, by the end of this talk, you'll at least have a fairly good framework to move forward and, and handle things with a little less head scratching and some good ideas for um, for, for best practices around this area. Um, before we dive in, I want to share a couple of term terms and terminology just to make sure we're all on the same page about them. So when I say assets, I'm talking about the, the non-code parts of your app, uh, sorry, the non-Python code parts of your app. I'm talking about CSS, JavaScript, images like logos or, or icons, you know, anything that you're using that's part of your app that isn't sort of interpreted, it isn't part of your Python code. Now, Django uses the term static for these things, and that's, that's a historical wart, like there wasn't, an, uh, wasn't a best practice name for this stuff back 15 years ago when we were inventing some of this. So um, you'll see most of the places around Django, you'll see the term static. Um, uh, I will try to use the word assets throughout this talk because I think it's clearer. Um, but you will still see in a lot of the settings and a lot of the Django documentation of the term static. And these are the same things. Django also uses this term media, which specifically refers to stuff that is sort of dynamic and uploaded. Um, and so these are things that users will upload. Uh, these could be admin users uploaded through the admin interface, or these, these could be end users of the site. But the point is, it's not part of your code base. It's not checked in. It's not distributed. It's not part of your app. It's something dynamic and, and uploaded. Images, PDF files, whatever all else you're letting your, folk, your, your users upload. And Django uses the term media for all of that stuff. So I'm going to cover four scenarios. The first scenario is the sort of simplest version. You, you've got some JavaScript or CSS, uh, and you're fine with that living on the file system. This actually covers probably 80% of the use cases, and the good news is this is very simple. Um, if there's a theme of this talk, it's don't overthink it, and this is the don't overthink it model. Like, you just need to write some JavaScript. JavaScript's really good now. You probably don't need a JavaScript pre-compiler pre unless you're doing pretty advanced stuff. Likewise, CSS is really good now. You probably don't need any sort of fancy CSS stuff until you do. <laughs> the, second, the second version is the, uh, the second scenario is the cloud storage scenario. So at a certain point, um, having your assets being shipped along with your code starts to fall apart. Um, this is sort of large scale in terms of traffic, but also large scale in terms of development team, large scale in terms of a lot of assets to be compiled and, shif and shifted around. So at a certain point, you probably want to start storing your stuff on a cloud storage service like S3 or the, the Google equivalent, et cetera. Um, this is also a prerequisite, in my mind, to doing media uploads correctly. Um, in most deployment scenarios, uploading having media uploads go to the actual web servers is a bad practice for a variety of reasons, um, from scalability to security to um, sort of just best practice development. So when you come to media uploads, you kind of need to have the cloud stuff worked out. And the good news is those things work well together. And finally, the last, the last sort of more, most complicated scenario is you want to do fancy stuff. You want to use JSX. You want to use ESNext. You want to use post-CSS. You want to, you know, you're building a big React app. Like, you've got all the sort of heavy front-end tooling, and you want that to work well with your, with your Django app. So the simple scenario. So you, most of the time, for, this is where you should start. And everything in this scenario kind of gets built on in the, in the later ones, so there's no downside to kind of starting, starting here. 
I always try to get away with this for as long as I can and only start to get more complex when I need, when I need to get more complex. Um, this, will, this will scale for most like, I don't know, like medium-ish you know, web apps actually f like fairly well. I would say 80% of what I develop is suited just fine with this, um, with this scenario. Um, this doesn't support any sort of fancy compilations. If you want to use post CSS or, le or less or SAS, you're out of luck here. Um, and it's relatively slow and inefficient, um, as we'll see in a bit. Um, so, you're going to want to use white noise. Um, white noise is a static uh, file server that lets you use Django to actually serve these static files. Back in the day, this was discouraged. Um, we used to encourage that people use a external third-party um, web server to serve static assets, something like Nginx. That's no, no longer the case. Uh, white noise is really quite good. It integrates super well with Django, and it means that you can just have one server out of the box that serves both your dynamic stuff and your, st and your static stuff. Um, as a bonus, white noise sets all the correct headers on your, on your assets so that if you uh, use a CDN like Cloudflare, it kind of just works. Like you just point Cloudflare at your Django site and you've got caching of all your static stuff. Like no, no configuration needed, it's real nice. So here's what setting up uh, this stuff looks like. There's really two key settings to pay attention to when you're thinking about static files, when you think about assets, excuse me. Um, there's the static files DIRS setting, which tells Django where your source files live, where the static files that you're writing live. And then there's the static root setting that tells Django where all of the static, all of the static files from those directories are going to be served by your, by your web server. And so when you run the collect static management command, uh, what's going to happen is Django is going to look at everything in those static file directories, uh, suck it all out, and drop it into that the directory pointed at by static root. And then you would then point your web server at that static root set, uh, directory. Now, white noise does this automatically, so you don't need that extra step. But if you wanted to use something like Nginx to serve your assets, you could just point it at that, at that directory. And the reason you need this level of indirection, by the way, is assets can be collected not just from the directories specified in that static, static files DIRS setting, but also from installed apps. So that's how, for example, the CSS and JavaScript associated with the admin get collected and put into that same directory so that when your admin is served, it, it, has, it has styles. If you've ever deployed a Django site, uh, turn debug off and suddenly discovered your admin doesn't have any styles, that's what's happening here. You haven't properly configured static files, and so the admin doesn't know where to find its CSS, and so you don't get styling in your admin. The last bit of this uh, uh, scenario is making sure that you're correctly referencing those files in your templates when you need to include a script or a CSS file. It's tempting just to use a... A, a, a statically uh, encoded path to them, but that's the wrong approach. That doesn't take into account future stuff you might do, like cloud storage. So there's a static tag that lets you um, that lets you point to a particular file, and what that actually does is it expands your static root setting um, and and the name of the file to correctly provide a link to that. And again, if you're using white noise, if you do this one with the green check mark, everything just kind of works. So in this scenario, your best practices are to use white noise, pay attention to your static file directories and your static root. Um, I would just, like, these are my common ones. I put, I put my static files in a directory called assets, and I have static root called static root so that I know exactly what it is. Um, reference your files with the static tag, and just run collect static at deploy time. Don't try to be fancy about when you run collect static. Uh, just run it every time you do a deploy, like as a, as a post-deploy step. If you're using Heroku or another, uh, another cloud library that uses the same build packs, collect static will be run automatically for you uh, for this reason. This isn't like the best practice in a global sense. Running, running uh, like asset compilation on your production servers is kind of a code smell, but for this sort of simple scenario, it's, it's fine, and don't overthink it. 
okay, so at a certain point, you, instead of just having stuff on your file system, you, you want to put them in, a, in, a cl in cloud storage. This might be you've got a bunch of images, and so blowing out your file system on all your app servers is a problem. This might be because you've got a bunch of different developers, and you're starting to separate front-end and back-end development, and so the process of deploying assets is a little bit complicated. Um, you might have high traffic, so you, wanna, you want the sort of efficiency and, and um, a uh, lower cost of something like S3. There's a bunch of reasons why you might want this. Um, you also might want to be doing this as a prerequisite for allowing um, users to upload media. At this point, um, uh, dev, dev prod parity, having, having equivalency between your local development environment and your deployment environment starts to be a concern, and I'm going to cover that in a minute, but keep, start thinking about it now. So the library you want to be looking at here is something called Django Storages. Django Storages provides built-in asset and media storage engines for b basically everything. Um, it even supports FTP, um, which I don't know that anybody's using anymore. If it doesn't, there is, there is an API to write your own uh, that's part of Django, and it's actually not that complex. If you look at the Django Storages source code, it's actually not particularly complicated. But um, most of the time, you can just install Django Storages plus whatever, whatever other third-party prereq like Bodo you need. And, and stuff will just work. You'll end up needing a bunch of settings. Um, this is my settings file. So th the stuff on top is basically all the sort of AWS um, preamble that you need to set up to make, to make these files uh, work right. The key is the, stuff, is the stuff in bold. So there's a couple of, of good practices here that I'm showing off. The first is that the static file storage setting is the main, is the main setting that controls what Django's collect static command uses to actually store the files. And so here I'm switching away from the default and saying I want to store stuff on S3. The other thing that I'm doing is specific to the S3 backend, but I'm giving a prefix to everything that I upload. And that lets me, that, that means when I run collect static on my laptop in debug, I upload my assets one place. So I can test that uploading step. I can make sure that AWS is working correctly and all my creds are good and I'm getting everything right. But it also won't stomp on my production files. There are a bunch of other ways you can do this. And once you start adding staging servers and review apps, this can get a little bit more complex. But it's a good practice here to start having, um, to start having sort of separation between where your assets upload so you don't accidentally upload testing stuff into your production server. Now, a big downside of doing it like I've done here is if um, at this point I can only develop online, right? Because when I run collect static or when I run my web server, I'm getting files served off of S3. I think this is probably a good idea because you want your local development environment to be as close to your production environment as possible, but that may not work for everyone, and so if it doesn't work for you, you, you could add some additional conditional logic in your settings file to when, you're, when debug is on, fall back to the white noise local file system storage like I presented in the previous one. That's just another line or two in your settings file, and it's, it's okay. It's a trade-off I want you to think about between, um, between having good parity between development and production, or making like coding on a plane something that you're able to do. So what Collect Static actually does that I skipped over the first time I showed you this slide is it actually consults this static file storage setting to figure out what to do with your assets. So it still is going to look in those static file directories, but what actually is happening is it's saying, all right, storage engine, I found, I found app.js. What do you want to do with it? And so in this case, in, in my example, the S3 storage says, OK, I want to stick that over on, over on S3 instead of sticking it in that static root file. And so now when I run collect static, my files get pulled from wherever they are in my source repository and pushed up to S3 or Dropbox or whatever else you're using for your, for your storage engine. And this is why you want to be using that static tag, because once I switch my storage engine over, it's actually going to ask my storage engine hey, what's the URL for app.js? And my storage engine is going to say, oh, hey, it's, um, it's this particular uh, uh, bucket URL, and it will actually get a full reference to, uh, to my S3 bucket. So if you want to do cloud storage, Django Storages is your, is your answer. It basically just works. It integrates well with all the rest of the stuff that we'll see later. The key setting to look at is your static file storage setting plus whatever other settings you need to configure that engine. The Django Storages docs are good. They'll tell you what you need to do. Just find your preferred engine of choice and walk through it. 
remember to reference static files and templates with the static tag. And finally, this is probably the point that you should think about a different way of actually deploying your assets to production. Um, doing it as part of the deploy step is going to slow down substantially now because you're pushing a bunch of files to a third part to, to an external storage engine rather than just copying them on disk. So this is a good time to start putting your collect static command into a CI task somewhere or some other post post deploy hook. That's kind of out of scope for this talk, but um, there are probably other talks here at PyCon about continuous integration, and uh, you should be able to figure that out with a little bit of a uh, little bit of head banging. All right, so media. Um, the use case here is where you want people to be able to upload files. And the good news here is if you've done step two, if you've done scenario two, this is super, super easy. Um, you do, I do really want to encourage you to um, take the added time to get a cloud storage engine set up before you allow uh, file uploads. Um, that's for a couple reasons. One is, one is safety and security. Although the file upload code in Django is like, pretty hardened and pretty hammered on and hasn't had security vulnerabilities in a long, long time, it's still dangerous to be letting people put stuff on your web server. And those, that danger is not the same as letting people put stuff in an S3 bucket you've set up specifically for letting people put stuff there. It also performs significantly better. You know, you can, the, 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 the speed of, the speed of a user downloading a file from S3 is probably going to be faster than from your web server. It's, not, it's, it's going to scale better, and it's going to scale with your team better, as I mentioned earlier. So I really, like, it's worth the extra time to figure out the S3, Azure, whatever stuff um, before you start letting people upload media files. So like I said, to upload media files, you want a storage engine, you should be using Django Storages. Uh, if the media files you're, you're allowing people to upload are images, Django also requires Pillow um, just to handle images at all, and so you'll want to uh, install that. Uh, but that's all you need, and from there it's pretty simple. Um, you can use an image field in, in a model. If you do it like that um, uh, and use a model form, it basically just works. Uploads to the admin are going to work automatically. They'll land on S3 as configured beforehand. Uh, basically just works. Uh, if you want to be doing custom stuff with, the, with files, you want to be st doing streaming uploads, you want to do some pre- or post-processing, consult the documentation. It's pretty good in this area. should be able to figure out some more, some more complex tax tasks without too much trouble. One best practice that I'm showing off here is the uh, upload to um, function. Image and file fields take this argument. It's a callback that, deter that determines the file name to upload to. Uh, it's not like a big deal, but it's going to make your life a lot easier if you've got a nice, clean URL there rather than some auto-generated you know, hash of something that you can't really figure out what that, what that file refers to. So I recommend taking the extra you know, 20 seconds to figure out a good file name for your stuff. And from there, you just set your default file storage setting to whatever storage you want to use, Azure, S3, what have you, and uh, bam, you're done. Um, you can actually... Uh, file fields and image fields take a storage argument too, so you could use different storages for different types of files. Like you could put images in one S3 bucket and video in another. Um, I've never actually run across a need for that, but may maybe you will. For models, uh, referencing stuff in templates is pretty simple. You just, you just get the whatever your image field or file field is named, and you have a .url, and that will automatically expand to get to the correct um, correct URL for your thing. Now you have to start thinking about how you want to handle this in development. So you're running things locally, and you want to test it out, and you want to upload an image file from your local laptop. So you kind of have to, this is that, that same sort of dev prod parity question. You have two options. One is to use S3 just like production does, and to use something like the AWS location setting to separate your development uploads from your production uploads. So this means that your sort of testing scenario is as close as possible to your production scenario, but again, you can't hack on, a, on an airplane. Is that something you need to be able to do? I don't know. It depends on your, your company and your organization. You can fall back to using file system media. There's a couple of settings to look up, media root and media URL, and you can serve them with a, with a built-in server designed for debugging. 
So this gets offline development at the cost of being different from production and potentially in introducing bugs. I can't tell you which is best for you. It's going to depend on your team. Um, there's some more documentation about how to use uploaded files in development at the link there. So to summarize, uh, use Django storage as in pillow. Use, uh, set the default file storage setting. Remember to define upload to. And think about local development options. All right, let's get to the good stuff, asset compilation. So this was the part that I was hoping would be really easy. It's not, sorry. Maybe if I was a better JavaScript developer, but I don't even, I've, I talked to a bunch of them and they don't even, they've told me not. So look, there's some really cool stuff in the, in the front end world. Like, I, I mean, I, I, I can joke about JavaScript, but the fact is it's an incredibly exciting space right now. There's some really, really cool stuff. If you haven't played around with TypeScript, you owe it to yourself to check it out. It's like MyPy, but way better, sorry. Um, if you haven't played with ES Next, it makes Java, that's what will be the next version of JavaScript. It's very cool. It has list comprehensions. It has generators. It, it feels like, it feels really familiar to Python, to Python users. It's like putting on, you know, a, jeans from a different brand. Like they fit real well, but they're a little, like some of them, some parts are a little different, but they're still real comfy. Um, Post CSS is super cool. I'm mildly obsessed with it. This is a cool area. And if you're using something like React, you kind of don't have a choice. You need to get into this, need to get in this area. The problem is it makes my head hurt. And like, if you're like me, it, it might make your head hurt too. Okay, so the best asset manager right now is Webpack. I know there are a bunch of Python asset managers. There's Django Pipeline, there's Django Compressor, there's, I don't know, I don't know what all else. The problem is they're not really that much better. They, you think like, okay, if I, if I use Webpack, I need to install NPM and I need to install a bunch of JavaScript stuff. But so, so, so something like Django Pipeline seems a lot simpler, uh, but, but the, the fact is that the, the Python ports of these compilers are not, as, are, are not the same as the JavaScript versions and will confuse people who are doing JavaScript front-end development. And things like Babel, the, the, the JavaScript, transpiler that converts ES Next into JavaScript that browsers will understand just don't have an equivalent in the Python world. So you almost always in, end up installing NPM anyway. And now if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go to that step, you might as well use Webpack, which is just better. Now, every time I talk about front-end development, <laughs> because I know high people in the future, you're watching this video and it's three years from now, this is probably wrong. My guess is that within a year, Parcel is going to replace Webpack as the best practice. My guess is if I, would, if I give this talk at PyCon 2020, I'm going to be talking about Parcel here. It's not there yet. Maybe play with it, but it's probably not ready for production. Webpack is significantly better right now. But as we'll see in a bit, Webpack, Webpack frustrates the heck out of me, and I think that Parcel is on its way to, to replacing it. But not yet. So what do you need to make this all work? You got to install NPM. You got to install Webpack plus a whole bundle of plugins. Uh, there's two very specific bits that make Webpack and Django play nice together. Uh, and these, this is the sort of, if there's a secret to this part of, to, to this talk, if there's a, a, like one big thing I learned about how to make this less painful, it's these two things. So Webpack bundle tracker makes Webpack generate a sort of a, a metadata file. And then Django Webpack loader will read that metadata file and do, and do the necessary to integrate it with your Django site. Um, so this is how I got it all working. Uh, I used a package manager to install a package manager to install an asset manager, real simple. Um, uh, I installed a bunch of, uh, of, of, N of NPM packages. Um, specifically, these are the ones that I installed to get SAS and Babel working. If you want, are wanting to use other ones, consult the Webpack docs. I don't really have time in this talk to really talk through exactly how Webpack works and what it does. The documentation is, is good, but it's complex. So I'd recommend giving yourself a good day or two to really sit down with it, work through a bunch of options, figure out how everything works, and kind of get, get all the details fleshed out. Um, it's not particularly difficult, but it is a bit time consuming. So Webpack is organized around um, this, this config file, webpack config.js. Um, and it's just, a pi it's just a JavaScript file that specifies a few different things. It starts with an entry point, which is the, the beginning of your sort of asset compilation chain. The way that Webpack works is you say, hey, index.js is the start of my app, 
And then index.js will import a bunch of stuff. And it can import other JavaScript files. It can import CSS files. It can import SAS or post-CSS files. And Webpack will figure out, based on those imports, what sort of translation and compilation need to happen. And when it's all done, it drops that off in a bundle file. Uh, and one of the keys to work doing this right with Django is making sure to include a hash in the, in the name of the bundle file. That way you get versioned assets, so it's easy to deploy a new version of your front end and then a new version of your back end without having to like, synchronize that in, in, a, in a particularly tight way. You give, it some, you give it some rules which say, hey, JavaScript files I want to compile with, with, um, with Babel. And then you've got to make sure to use this plugin. That's the little key bit that makes it spit out that, um, that statistics file. And so at that point, you add some stuff to your settings file. You install the Webpack Loader app, and you give it a little bit of configuration. You can consult the docs for, for details here, but these are the, this is the minimum, and this will be enough to get it working. And then you run two commands. First, you run Webpack, which follows that index.js and brings all your things and puts it in a bundle. And then you run collect static. And that takes the bundle that's now been generated and, and pushes it to S3 or does whatever all else needs to happen with it. And that's the like, cool little magic that Webpack Loader does, is it makes sure that when you run collect static, collect static knows how to find your compiled bundles and shove them in the, in the right place. There's some other cool stuff in that library, too, like support for li live reloading and those sorts of things. You can take a look. Now, in your templates, instead of using the static, tag, there's a new one, render bundle, and you say, I want to render my, my main bundle. This is what would let you have multiple different types of, of bundles. Say if you have different parts of your app that need different, different prerequisites, different JavaScript files. So this is how this, this whole thing works, right? It's going to look at your index.js. It's going to compile everything using Webpack, spitting out that bundle, and then collect static will push it off to your, to your cloud server. Now, it's real tempting at this point to try to automate this more. Um, we're running two different commands. It feels a little manual, like, can't I just automat automatically reload stuff? I just want to edit my post-CSS file and have my CSS be spit out and automatically uploaded to S3 and happen all automatically. You, that, you actually can do that. Th that will work. However, I started to go down, down that path, and I very rapidly got very, very confused. I recommend actually leaving it pretty simple and doing it by hand, maybe using a CI server for this, because otherwise it can get real hairy real quick, and you can end up with a lot of confusion about what's doing what, and what's watching what, and what's listening. Um, I didn't really understand what was happening here until I threw out all the fancy stuff and got super simple with it. So my recommendation would be to do the same. So, Webpack is the best practice here right now. Uh, I, I think that may change in the future. Or I predict it will change in the future. But for right now, that's the one you should be using. Uh, there's really nothing that compares to it that's as flexible, that has as many options, or that will do all the things that you might possibly need to do. Um, the key connection bit is that Django, uh, that should read Django Webpack Loader on that slide. That's the, that's the, um, that's the key connection bit. Again, I, reckon, I recommend using a CI task and be very careful about premature uh, automation. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jacob. I think I have time uh, for maybe one or two I, questions. I think we have time for one question. All right. Who's so going to be the lucky? The first Russ first isn't, first the, isn't here, have so a someone else has to do it. Yes. Oh, okay. No, you, go for it. Thank you. Uh, what do you think on the thoughts of uh, faking uh, your cloud storage for your local development? When you were talking about the option one, option two, and you're on the airplane. Faking, so running something that like pretends to be S3 lo locally, but isn't actually? Yes, sir. Um, I'm not aware of anything that does that, uh, but it's not, it's not a terrible idea, now you're, now, because now your Django app is just speaking the same old APIs, but you're faking it at a, at a different point. So if there's something that, ru that runs locally and works there, yeah, that could be cool. If you know of something, let me know after the talk. I'd love to play with it. Thanks again, y'all. Thank you again, Jacob. Uh, it's now lunchtime. Uh, enjoy your lunch, and we'll see you after the break. <laughs>